is Luis Verduzco, and I am an anesthesiologist and intensivist at a county hospital. We see a lot of trauma, specifically a lot of traumatic brain injury, which will be the topic that we will be discussing in this lecture. My hope is that by the end of this lecture, you um, will be better prepared for the USMLE part two in regards to traumatic brain injury as well as the physiology involved in brain injury. And more importantly, that you will have basic principles that will make you feel much more comfortable the first night that you perhaps are in a trauma ICU dealing with a patient who comes in with, for example, a large epidural hematoma. So this is our content outline for our, this lecture. We're going to define traumatic brain injury. We're going to describe the different types. Then we will move on to the management of traumatic brain injury, focusing on cerebral perfusion pressure and intracranial hypertension, and then conclude with complications of traumatic brain injury. This particular lecture will be divided into two parts. So I'd like to begin with a clinical scenario of a patient that I actually took care of. So we have a previously healthy 55-year-old female who developed gastroenteritis, and while she was driving to the store to buy toilet paper, she syncopized and drove through a red light. She hit a tree dead on at 45 miles per hour and had a prolonged extrication by the paramedics. In other words, it took a while to get her out of the car. At the scene, her GCS, or Glasgow Coma Scale, was 8, and therefore she was intubated using inline stabilization. In other words, they were very careful with her cervical spine. She was then transported to the hospital, and evaluation in the emergency department was notable for hypotension, coma with a very left blown pupil, and ST elevations in the precordial leads of her EKG. A limited transthoracic echo of her heart demonstrated severe hypokinesis of the midventricular walls with ballooning of the apex for which she was starting on dopamine. There was immediate improvement in her blood pressure. Full body CT scanning was completely unremarkable except for a very large left-sided extraaxial hematoma that was causing severe midline brain shift. She was therefore emergently taken to the operating room for decompressive craniectomy. In other words, they removed part of the, the bone of the, of the skull to allow that brain to come out this way as opposed to going herniating down into the foramen magnum, which is the hole at the bottom of the skull that connects the brain to the spinal cord. So dramatic brain injury is essentially any external force that causes an insult to the brain. It can be categorized by mechanism, for example, blunt injury, um, which is an acceleration-deceleration kind of brain injury. It can be penetrating injury, where a projectile actually goes through the skull into the brain, lacerates the tissue, and there is tissue compression and expansion. Or it could be a blast injury, such as a grenade going off in um, what we see often in soldiers that go off and uh, unfortunately are at war. And it's, this energy is transmitted through the skull and through the vasculature of the brain, and you get very rapid brain um, edema over hours as opposed to over 12 to 24 hours that you see in the other type of brain injuries. Um, the other thing that you see with blast injuries actually is cerebral vasospasm. You can also define it by morphology. For example, is it an injury that's diffuse or just focal, in other words, localized to one spot? So what exactly is the Glasgow Coma Scale and why do we use it? So Glasgow Coma Scale allows us to define the severity of this traumatic brain injury, and we define it as either mild, moderate, or severe by using the best eye-opening response, the best verbal response, and the best motor response. For example, if somebody spontaneously opens their eyes when I walk into the room, you'd give them a score of four. They don't open their eyes no matter what you do. Either you yell at them, you pinch them, they would get a score of one. For verbal response, just like here, if they're completely oriented and having a conversation with you, it would be a score of five. On the other hand, if essentially they're just moaning and making sounds, they would score a two. The best motor response would be a six, if you ask them to lift their arm and they lift it, that would be a six. On the other hand, if you are pinching them around their chest and they are attempting to reach the chest but they're not actually able to get to it, that would be localizing um, the pain. As opposed to, for example, if you pinch their body and they just sort of withdraw the whole body away, a general response that would be just um, that would be 
a withdrawal kind of uh, score, which would be a score of four. Now, score of now score of three or two is flexion or extension, which is also known as decorticate posturing, which the upper extremities flex and the lower extremities extend. And then there is decerebrate posturing or extension score of two, where the arms go straight out and outwards and your legs are also extended. That would be a score of two. So therefore you have mild, moderate, and severe injury. Any patient who has a score of eight or less will get intubated. It's also known as if your GCS is eight, then you intubate. If you come in with moderate or severe TBI, you automatically get a CT head. On the other hand, if you come in with mild TBI, there's actually multiple scoring things that you look at to determine whether somebody should get a CAT scan of the head. For example, if they are retching multiple times, if they have not returned to a score of 15 within two hours, it would be another reason to get a CT scan of the head. Obviously, if somebody has mild traumatic brain injury, but if they're on aspirin or Coumadin, they would also get um, a CT head. Now, I just want to uh, step back a little bit and talk about the cranial sutures because that will be important when we define um, the limits of an epidural hematoma. So the skull essentially is made up of multiple bones. You have the frontal bones, the parietal bones, the occipital bones, the temporal bones, and then there's other bones, but those are the big ones um, of, of the skull. And these are all connected via the sutures, which are fusion points that fuse over the first year. The reason a child is born with these sutures is the, is a rapid brain development throughout the throughout the first year, which and these having these sutures allows the brain to expand within the skull. Now, what are these sutures? So essentially, you have a frontal suture, a coronal suture a sagittal suture, and in the very back, you have a landoid suture. Those are the big sutures. And as you can see at the very front, you have the fontanelle, the frontal fontanelle, and then you have an occipital fontanelle, which are those soft spots that you feel in a newborn. Um, and I'll describe why the sutures are important in just a, a second. Um, Real quick, I will mention that at these sutures, the dura is very tightly attached to the skull such that you cannot actually separate the dura any further. So you have essentially this suture and the, and the dura is riding right below it, okay? And essentially the, the dura actually is able to slightly go into that suture and is very tightly adherent at those specific points. So let's turn a little bit here and talk about basic skull and brain anatomy. So you have these coverings outside the brain, which are called the meninges, the brain meninges. You have a dura, which is also which translates to tough matter, the arachnoid, and the pia. The dura actually splits into two parts. You have the periosteal, which is the outer, and then you have the inner dura. That's important because the dura, when it splits into two, helps to this split allows the formation of the cerebral sinuses which are essentially the drainage system of the brain, that then leads to the internal jugular veins, which then leads to the right atrium and goes back is in, is in essentially back into your right ventricle and et cetera. Um, the, the brain has a total of 1.5 liters of brain parenchyma, 150 cc's of CSF and 150 cc's of blood, both arterial and venous. You actually replace your CSF three times in a day because you make about 450 cc's of CSF per day. Your normal cerebral blood flow is you get 50 cc's of blood per every 100 grams of brain per minute. And this is maintained between a mean arterial pressure of 50 and 150. What that means is even if your blood pressure goes up, as long as you stay between those two maps, the brain, the cerebral vasculature vasoconstricts or vasodilates to maintain cerebral blood flow at 50 cc's per 100 grams per minute, assuming that the brain parenchyma is normal. When you have injured brain, that vasculature's ability to autoregulate gets altered. 
Now, one of the common things that gets tested in the U.S. simile are sort of the layers from the outside all the way in of the anatomical structures. So just to run right through those, you have the sub tissue. Then below that, you have something called the galea aponeurotica, sort of this thick connective tissue. Then you have the periosteum below that. Then you have the cranial bone. Then you have the dura, again, which has two parts to it, which is seen in this image right here to form the superior sagittal sinus. You can see here the dura splits into two to form the superior sagittal sinus, and it also the inner dura actually ends up coming downwards to form the cerebral fox, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. So again, you have the dura, and then you have the arachnoid, the pia, then you have the gray matter, which are where the cortical cells are, which then give off the white matter, which are the accent, axons. Okay, I have here in this um, uh, slide the cerebral sinuses, which are, again, formed by the splitting of the dura. The main sinus is called the superior sagittal sinus, which runs right on the top. Okay. So let's discuss now the different brain injury subtypes. So the first subtype is called the epidural hematoma. So the epidural hematoma is an extra-axial hematoma. And what, what I mean by extra-axial, I mean that is it is outside the actual brain parenchyma. It is often caused by an injury to the middle meningeal artery, which runs right here on the side. Okay, sort of a weak spot uh, that often gets injured, and the middle meningeal artery runs right um, in this region, under the uh, obviously under the skull. Therefore, you see it. You see the an epidural hematoma adjacent to a skull fracture, and it forms this sort of lens convex shape. This is where the concept of the sutures are important. As you can see in this image, we are pointing to an epidural hematoma, by, which is pointed by this blue arrow, and you can see that it stops anteriorly at the coronal suture and posteriorly, or probably around the lambdoid suture. And that is because, once again, at these specific spots, the dura is very tight, tightly connected to the suture, and this blood that is essentially running right above the dura is coming this way, tracking until it hits that suture and it has to stop. And because that blood can no longer go this way, it starts to push inwards towards the brain parenchyma, therefore forming this sort of lens-like picture. As like I said, it does not cross suture lines, but it can cross the midline. In fact, it's not uncommon to see an epidural that crosses the midline and presses the superior sagittal sinus downwards. Classically, these are patients who have an injury and they syncopize or they have loss of consciousness and then they wake up soon after that and they have this lucid interval and then a few hours later they start getting kind of sleepy. Family members think that they just need to get some rest and then they don't wake up because they end up herniating. Now the next one is called a subdural hematoma. This is also an extra-axial hematoma outside the brain, and this is caused by injury to the bridging veins. And I'll describe what those bridging veins are in a second. It tends to form more of a concave or crescent-shaped picture, as you can see here by the black arrow. And this does cross the suture lines, and the reason for that is because the subdural hematoma, just like it says, runs below the dura and is not limited by the sutures. But because of that, it does not cross the midline because once again you have this dura that splits anterior at the very top and, and forms the cerebral fox and because the subdural space is below the dura that subdural space therefore ends up going also onward, uh, downward sorry, and cannot continue to track this way to go around um, the midline. Often is formed caused by an acceleration or deceleration injury. And classically in the human MSMLE, you'll see it connected with a sentence that talks about an elderly falling or alcoholics. Now I'm going to go back to this picture to show the, um, the bridging veins. So the bridging veins you can see here on the left side of the picture says these, these veins that are connecting essentially the skull through the dura into the 
brain parenchyma, those get sheared and you get this bleeding into the subdural space. And you can see here that you also have the cerebral fox going downwards and below, immediately below the dura, you have the subdural space and that's where that blood tracks. Again, the epidural space and the subdural space are not real spaces in the brain. These are potential spaces, excuse me, potential spaces that can exist if blood tracks into them. On the other hand, in the spinal, in the spinal cord anatomy, the subdural space does not exist as well, but the epidural space is a true anatomic space. The next slide is the subarachnoid hematoma. This is also an extraaxial hematoma. It is caused by injury to the peel vessels, which are vessels that are running in the, min, in the pia. And this is blood in the CSS space. And uh, these, what you see here pointed by this black arrow is part of, of the basal cisterns. So the basal means the bottom part of the brain. The cisterns is just a collection of CSF. And when you have essentially blood in these basal cisterns, and, and what you end up having is something called an obstructive hydrocephalus, because CSF eventually ends up draining via the arachnoid granulations into the sinuses. But if these arachnoid granulations get stuck, stick, sorry, stick, uh, um, filled with thick, viscous blood, it cannot be reabsorbed into the sinuses, and therefore you end up developing um, obstructive hydrocephalus, which means that you have an enlargement of the CSS spaces in the brain. We have something called ventricles, which are collections of CSF as well, which is where the actual CSF is produced. We have two lateral ventricles that are in this region, which are the main lateral ventricles, which then connect together to form the third ventricle, which is then connected via a little um, duct to the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is found in the brainstem behind the pons. So you can imagine if, um, once again, if the CSF is, continues to be produced but it's not being reabsorbed, you have an obstructive um, hydrocephalus. So, uh, Subarachnoid hemorrhages are caused by trauma, but they can also be caused by aneurysms or arteriovenous malformations. Classically, when a, trauma, a traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, you see blood not everywhere, as in this picture. This is more consistent with an aneurysmal bleed. Um, subarachnoids due to trauma tend to be um, focal subarachnoids. Um, now, one thing that's often tested in the USMLE is when you have these um, aneurysms around the circle of Willis, which is the, the part of the circuit, the uh, um, circulatory system essentially of the brain at the bottom of the brain, it's a circle that forms these little aneurysms called berry aneurysms, and those are associated with polycystic kidney disease. I will also mention that unlike traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhages, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhages, sorry, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhages are associated with something called cerebral vasospasm, and that's what it means is when this vasculature in the brain begins to vasoconstrict, causing ischemia. Nobody knows really, nobody really knows why it happens, but it can happen anywhere between 0 and 21 days. Uh, classically, it uh, starts to happen around days 5 through 7. And you treat it with a medicine called nemotipine, which is a calcium channel blocker for about 21 days. Another thing that you can see with, with subarachnoid hematoma is something called SIADH, or syndrome of inappropriate ADH release, or cerebral salt wasting syndrome. Both of these syndromes can lead you to lose, uh, sorry, can lead you to have hyponatremia. But in cerebral salt wasting, the physiology is that you are losing salt, and because salt tracks water, you're losing a lot of salt and a lot of water, and you have a high urine output and essentially a hypovolemia, which you treat with volume recitation and salt tabs. And the other thing that you can do is give fludrocortisone, which is essentially the equivalent of aldosterone that binds to the ENAC channel in the distal collecting tubule to help you reabsorb sodium and water. On the other hand, SIDH, as you can imagine, because you have a high levels of ADH, you have a lot of reabsorption of water uh, via the vasopressin 2 receptors that 
leads to uh, decreasing urine output and you also get a hyponatremia. In these patients, what you want to do is fluid restrict them to minimize the hyponatremia. The second to last hematoma I want to describe is an intracerebral hematoma, which is an intraaxial bleed, which is within the brain. And this can be caused by trauma, again, arteriovenous malformations or a tumor. And in this situation, often the hematoma um, goes into the ventricles. And in this picture, you can see this bright white stuff in the middle of the brain is actually blood. And then and on the um, you can see these black spots, and those are part of the ventricles. You can see the blood is in the ventricles, and you're going to get a significant hydrocephalus as a result of this. You have, this is a pretty uh, poor, uh, a very poor prognosis. The last one I will describe is called diffuse axonal injury, so diffuse injury of the axons, the white matter. This is often caused by traumatic shearing of the axons, and as expected, it often happens right at the junction of the great and white matter right where the axon takes off from the cell body. CT scan is very poor at seeing this diagnosis, but MRI will show these sort of black spots, um, which you can see with the blue arrows in the, in, uh, in the image in front of us. Again, it has a very poor prognosis. The next thing I will discuss is brain herniation. When we describe herniation, we talk about a herniation as either supratentorial or infratentorial. The tentorium is a dural, the tentorium, what it is, is basically a dural extension that separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. The cerebrum from the cerebellum. Here in this image, it's the indentation that you see going inwards um, right below number one here in the diagram, that black sort of indentation. Um, uh, that you see in this picture. So there's multiple types of herniations, but the key ones that I want to talk about is number one is the uncle herniation. And uncus is the medial part of the temporal lobe, which is number one here, herniating downwards through the tentorium uh, cerebelli. And what ends up happening is that you often, this is what leads to that blown pupil history. And the reason that happens is because you are pressing on cranial nerve three, the ocular motor nerve. The ocular motor nerve, along with three other cranial nerves, 7, 9, and 10, facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus, contains parasympathetic activity. On the, and it, specifically, it has it around and the periphery of the ocular motor nerve. So one of the first things you will see is a blown pupil, because the parasympathetic part of the cranial nerve 3 is what causes your eye, the pupil, sorry, to constrict when you have a light shining on it, but because it's being pressed upon by the uncus, it loses that function. The nucleus of this parasympathetic function is called the Ettinger-Westphal nucleus, which is found in the midbrain in the posterior part of it. The other cranial nerves of importance for parasympathetic function are cranial nerve 7, which provide function to the lacrimal mouth glands, cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal, which Functions, which provides function to the parotid gland, and then cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve, which is sort of the father of parasympathetic function, which gives parasympathetic function to the heart, the lungs. We, as a, classically, you get the bradycardia, the bronchoconstriction for the lungs, inability for the GI uh, system to function. The other thing I want to talk about regarding the uncle herniation is something that's tested called a false localizing not, uh, sign or Kernahan's, Kernahan's notch. So the right side of the brain, the motor cortex on the right side gives function to the left side of your body. What happens is these cells send axons down towards the midbrain through the cerebral peduncles, which are the anterior part of the midbrain. Immediately thereafter, they crisscross, they cross towards the opposite of side of the brain, and hence the reason that the right side gives function to the left side. But if you can imagine that if I have any kind of herniation, that for example, if I have a herniation on the left side of my brain, that then for some reason causes pressure on the opposite side of the brain, it will essentially look, it will essentially press on the cerebral peduncle on this side and therefore the, mo the motor axons that are coming from this side will be injured or pressed upon, and therefore the left side of the brain won't uh, 
the, sorry, the left side of the body's motor function will be injured. So that's why it's called the false localizing side because the dysfunction, the left side, is on the same side as the initial brain injury, right? So you would expect the right side not to work, but here it's the left side. And the reason, again, is because this hematoma on this side is causing counterpressure on the opposite cerebral peduncle, and therefore the, it, it's not, it's preventing the left side from working. Again, called the false localizing sign. Another injury that you see is a subfalsing injury or the cingulate gyrus injury, and that's right in this middle region, right below the cerebral fox in the um, in the middle region. And what you have is pressure on the anterior cerebral arteries, right, run right here, and give um, blood supply to the frontal medial lobes, which is where the function of the legs is. In other words, these are where the motor cells that provide function to the legs exist. So what you have in this situation is weakness of the legs, but normal function essentially of your upper extremities. We have something called the homunculus, which basically means that the motor cortex provides function to the legs around this region, and then it walks over to the essentially the, extre the upper extremities. So injury here will affect your upper extremities. Injury here will affect your lower extremities. Then the last one I will conclude with is the infratentorial herniation, which is tonsillar herniation, which is what we're talking about here is the cerebellar tonsils. And what happens here with cerebellar tonsils would be number six, is that it, it um, begins to press on the, uh, on the foramen magnum, which is that hole at the very bottom of the skull, and begins to compress the lower brain stem as well as the cervical spinal cord. Okay, this is where the cardiac and the respiratory centers exist. One of the things that is often tested in the USMLE is the hypoglossal nerve or cranial nerve 12 and its motor function. Cranial nerve 12 provides motor function to the tongue. And the tongue always points towards the side of the lesion. What does that mean? The right uh, cranial nerve 12 pushes the tongue towards the left and the left cranial nerve 12 pushes it towards the right. So these are always in the balance. So if I have a lesion of my right hypoglossal nerve, the tongue will deviate towards the right because this cannot push this way, but this maintains its function and pushes it this way, okay? The hypoglossal nerve originates in the medulla, which is the most inferior part of the brainstem. The brainstem has three parts, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. The medulla connects to the cervical spinal cord, okay? I'm going to go ahead and conclude with the two major dural divisions of the brain, the cerebral fox and the tentorium cerebelli. The cerebral fox runs in the middle part of, by right between the two cerebral hemispheres. It is created by the dura. Recall the dura comes across this way, separates into two. You have the periosteal layer, and then you have the inner layer. Between those two layers, you have the superior sagittal sinus, that is the drainage system of the brain, which eventually ends up draining into the two internal jugular veins. Anteriorly, the cerebral fox, which again divides the two cerebral hemispheres, attaches to a bone called the crista galli. In between the two cerebral hemispheres runs the anterior cerebral arteries, which provide blood flow to the medial part of the frontal lobes. The medial part of the frontal lobes give motor function to the bilateral lower extremities. So you get ischemia of the anterior cerebral arteries, your bilateral lower extremities will not work. Okay. Then you have the other division called the tentorium cerebelli, which basically divides the brain into a cerebrum and a lower part called the, the cerebellum as well as the brainstem. This is important because when you have uncle herniation, the reason this occurs is because you have this tentorium cerebelli and the uncus or the medial part of the temporal lobe herniates downwards through and into the tentorium cerebellum, leading to that pressure that we described in a previous slide regarding the pupillary dilatation. This concludes part one of the TBI lecture. In the next lec, in the in part two of the TBI lecture, I will discuss.
not only TBI management, but I will focus on two key concepts often tested in the USMLE, cerebral perfusion pressure, intracranial hypertension, and then I will conclude with complications of traumatic brain injury, one of which is often tested in the USMLE, and it's called Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy. Okay, we will see you in just a bit.